Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Hey, Miguel Iterate, back on the Lights Out podcast. Chris Lytle has us on assignment again, and uh, I've got the MMA detective, and uh, Mike Davis is going to run the interview here. And uh, we are once again in legends territory. Sometimes the legends word may get thrown around a little loosely, but not today. Not today. We got Tom Erickson joining us to help us out with the Gary Goodridge deep dive. Mike, Gary Goodridge, man. It's like a dream come true. Yeah. So, Gary, we have a lot of the other older guys, the, I should say the pioneers on this podcast. And you know, of course you're on that list and man, we got to get to Gary. I don't think people understand how underappreciated your career is based on its totality. Arm wrestling, K1 kickboxing, MMA, you fought world champions at world championship level in all three of those. And I don't think there's another human being alive that can say they've done something like that. Uh, that, that's all good and stuff. But let me tell you something that a lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't know the man that everybody was afraid of. The man in both uh, MMA and uh, kickboxing was Tom Erickson. He was the <laughs> biggest. I'm telling you, man, this guy, everybody was afraid of. Nobody in MMA would fight this guy. He had the that he had to make all sorts of different uh, things to have have people to fight him. Um, but the, er, anything that's underappreciated is Tom. Tom, uh, yeah. he, he was my best friend in the sport, as I said. Um, it was hard to get him a matchup because nobody would take the matchup. Um, as a matter of fact, some people, I believe Mark Coleman and uh, some other person said that how they will uh, they'll sign in to fight but um, put on their contract that they would never fight Tom Erickson. Anyways, that's where I wanted to start at. So let's talk about you got a project coming up. The African Fighting Championship in Nairobi, December 10th. How does this come together? What is it? Please let us know. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fighting organization, the exact same as the UFC, but out of, uh, out of Nairobi. Um, the Nairobi con- uh, thing, it's uh, AFC, um, just like the UFC, but um, uh, our first fight is... Uh, uh, December 8th, sorry, December 10th in Nairobi, uh, Kenya. So uh, I'm really, really looking forward to it. Uh, as you know, we can never have enough sponsors, enough um, enough uh, investors, um, always looking. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm really excited. I, I, I called out to Tom and asked him if he'd come down and Mark Coleman and asked him if he'd come down and Maury Smith. So we're all supposed to be going down um, for December 10th. Um, I'm going to be there for a while. I hope Tom and, and the other guys can come down and stay for a while too, but, um, I, I'm just excited. I'm excited about it. I would never do anything that, uh, that, uh, that Tom wasn't involved in. Like Tom, like I said, in this game, Tom was my best friend, no matter what happened, he always had my back, whether it be uh, physically or mentally or, or, you know, financially, he always had my back and, uh, we were the, um, the Starskin Hutch, uh, so to speak. <laughs> so, so Gary, how does the event take, like, come together in order to take place in Nairobi? Do you have family there? No. Um, actually, my family comes from uh, uh, Congo. That's where um, I, I trace my roots to. But uh, Nairobi, um, I started talking with a, a young lady on the, um, on the internet. I went down there and I saw um, everything. And then we just started talking to each other there. And here, and um, we came up with uh, with AFC and and things to do. So she's a lawyer down there, and uh, she's got uh, she's hire a few people to help her work for her. So um, yeah, we got just they thing come out of nowhere, and AFC just started up. Um, actually, we've been talking about it for a year, uh, uh, just about a year, and uh, we decided that we're gonna have our first tournament. That's and fantastic. of course, uh, I needed my best friend with me in the game. Uh, so Tom's coming. That's cool. And, and you know, talk about a country that's rich with talent, our, our continent, I should say, not country, continent. Um, 
I mean, Africa, I mean, it, I, I know South Africa has a, like, like it, I think it's EFC, but you know, the other regions of Africa are just rife with, with, with raw talent waiting to kind of, you know, get pulled out of there, much like boxing in the eighties. Lots of, lots of Africans came to the forefront. Yeah. So let's talk about UFC 8, February 16th, 1998. It's your first fight in the UFC. Uh, Paul Herrera is your yeah. first opponent. Yeah. Well, you know, um, it, was, I, it was before I got there, I was told I was fighting uh, Tank Abbott's protege. And at the time... Was it Eddie Ruiz? I'm, no, I'm no, call, it's Paul Herrera. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Thank you. Yeah, they didn't yeah. identify him. They didn't ident- they, they didn't identify him. See, Tank was trying to grab a wrestler, and Herrera was from actually from Nebraska, if I remember correctly. Okay. So Paul Herrera, I actually have that in my notes. Thank you, Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, Gary. So with, with Tank, you're scheduled to fight Tank's protege and Yeah. And uh and fighting this guy, uh, I was told that Tank was racist and uh he was this and he was that. And, and, man, I had to beat this guy. I had to make sure this guy can beat me because, of course, he's racist. But they were telling me this to get me uh, pumped up for the fight. And, of course, they're telling me somebody's racist. Like, man, I want to beat his ass. So, uh, <laughs> so anyways, uh, we stayed up the whole night before. Well, sorry. Uh, back then, um, people wouldn't like you watching their tra- watching them train. People wouldn't like you... Um, seeing anything so they used to keep the room door closed when they're training look at their techniques i'm not sure if they still do that now but i'm you know that i'm sure they still do but um you weren't allowed to see what they're doing they close the door put papers in front of the windows because they can't see which is fine but i had a friend of mine seeing what was going on um a friend that came with me seeing what was going on so they saw his move man he's gonna do the fireman carry on you because he kept on practicing and practicing, and back then, they'd um, back then they'd uh, take a shot of the who's fighting and have them say a few words, have the opponents say a few words, and then they'll film it just before they come out. And uh, that's how it went down. And he did the fireman's carry again. So uh, we knew it was gonna do what he was gonna do. So we stayed up all night on how to combat. So um, so who's we? Later, who, who's we? Six hours later, after my train, after my training for that, he's doing the same thing to me. So it worked out perfect. Was that with Gary's, Gary's first wrestling coach was John Knapp. He had a guy, a gentleman by the name of John Matt Knapp, was one of Gary's first wrestling coaches. Yes. So you said we were practicing. Was that with the traditional martial artist? I think his last name is. Let me get right here. Was it Fong? Fong Tran, yes. Is it Fong? Okay, so is he the one who came up with the counter to yes. the fireman scary? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Wow. Did you uh, have any well, issues afterward with Tank Abbott? Any no, words? No, no. Uh, matter of fact, I, I really, uh, in, in the fight game, you know, everybody says all kind of shit, but um, I saw Frank with a, with a black girl, so I said, okay, he's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, wow. so that that was the day that we learned what like eight elbows in three seconds looks like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now, at the time, but but when you look back and see it, it just it was vicious. It was dangerous. I'm just glad he didn't get hurt. Yeah. Well, what was that's what I was. What was the situation afterwards was he taking on a stretcher was he woozy or because uh, you got to focus on the next fight did you take that in uh didn't take it in i you know you have to focus on the next fight so got over it you know pat on the back rub your head and then get back in the dressing room and get ready for the next one um so yeah i, I didn't really take it in until after the tournament the whole tournament went by then you can uh just replay it in your head what happened Mm-hmm. I got Chris Lytle texting me. I apologize. He's a big <clears throat> fan of Big Daddy. And he's like, wait a minute, I'm coming. So either way, so you put a, a Tank Abbott disciple. He's a he wrestler at University of Nebraska, as Tom had said. All-American. He's also a two-time judo champion and two-time junior college national champion. 
I mean, that's that's a pretty tough opponent to go through in such a quick matter of uh, you yeah. know, under a minute, like thirteen seconds. I think they were calling him Hellbows at that point. <laughs> the thing is, for like football or any wrestling, um, if you know what your opponent's doing, you know what he's doing. Um, ninety nine point nine percent. This person is doing that. It makes it very easy to counter it and and plan for it. It makes it very easy. Ask Tom for himself. Is it not so Tom? You know this no, person. Absolutely. Left leg or the right leg. You know what to do. You know exactly what to do. Oh, huh. you train for and that. There's a couple of conflicting stories about how you got to the UFC. Yeah. Would you mind bringing us through exactly what took place in order to? you know, ensure that you appeared on UFC 8? Well, what happened was um, we watched UFC with, um, we watched UFC uh, with uh, Remco Pardue. I said, when Remco Pardue elbowed the hell out of this one guy, I think it was, um, uh, I forget his Yeah. I said, yes. And then I, I was thinking, whoa, whoa, I don't want no part of that. Before the end of the show, um, friends that I was watching with were dialing up the, the number that popped up. The UFC paraphernalia is this. You can have this. And they were calling. Anyways, they got on the phone and they called this person. that gave them the number to this person. that gave them the number to that person. Finally got a hold of Art Davies. And uh, I get on the phone with Art Davies. Uh, if you guys don't know Art Davies, he's the guy that started the whole thing. The founder. Yeah, he was the founder. He invented it. He just what we're going to call. So anyways, uh, our Davies uh, get on the phone and he says, what's your name? Gary Goodrich? Are you not that arm wrestler? I said, yeah. He says, you, you spoke well. UFC's got a home for you. So uh, then I'm in UFC. Uh, the next day, he call, he, we asked my, for my phone number and all my uh, other information that night. The next day, he called me and says, okay, you're fighting in three weeks in San Juan, Puerto <laughs> Rico. That simple. And in uh, three weeks, I was in San Juan, Puerto Rico, fighting Paul Herrera. Now, this is... Go ahead, I, I do have one question for you. I think, I don't want to get wrong, but I think you're the second Canadian behind Harold Howard. I think actually Gaza Kalman was also Canadian. But did you feel like you were better than Howard? Did you know his reputation before? Did, were you like feeling like you were representing Canada? I didn't feel like I represented anybody. I just wanted to kick some ass. It looked like fun. I thought it was fun. I didn't think I was representing anyone or any country. I just thought I'd go out there and make some money. It looked pretty easy to win 50000 And uh, <laughs> I wanted to get that money. Yeah. So it's an eight-man tournament, obviously. Yes. Your second opponent. And, Miguel, this is the famous event, after-party event. Uh, with Coleman and, you know, threatening the entire room. So we're going to get to that in a minute. But your second opponent was a very tried and rugged Jerry Bolander, one of my favorite fighters from back in the day. A- any concerns about fighting the Lion's Den prospect? No, I, I never even I, I never even looked at Jerry. I never even thought about Jerry. It was just the first match was in my head that I had to beat this guy. After I beat that guy, it didn't matter who I lost him. I just needed to beat Jerry Bolander. Uh, sorry, I'm for um, Don Herrera. Herrera, thanks. And uh, I didn't really look at anybody else. I just looked at everything was spent on Paul. So uh, when when they said they came back, said, "Okay, you find Jerry Bolander. Okay, what does he do? Who is he? What does he do?" So we're trying to figure out what he's. Oh, he's uh, Ken Shamrock's protege. I said, "Man, can they give give me somebody easier?" Oh well, he's a Oh, you should be able to beat him. Sorry, I'm very low, 100, 198 pounds or something like that. So, okay. The, uh, again, it was the David versus the Goliath tournament. So I felt that I had an advantage being bigger and stronger. And uh, so I, I got in there with Jerry, and he just sucked the life out of me. Um, he worked the guard. Uh, of course, we didn't know back then how to do the guard, any of that shit. Um, pardon my French. Uh, so uh, we ended up rolling around, Tesla doing some rough and tumble. And uh, finally, I got him into a position that I thought I could uh, finish him. Or I, as soon as I was able to strike him, I, I did. And John McCarthy was all over because of how the first guy went out. He didn't let me hit him too much. Okay. So in my opinion, 
whatever happened against Paul Herrera, which is absolutely frightening for the next 15 years, it's on the UFC like highlight reel and entrance in every single one of their events. Um, it's referred to as recency bias. Whatever took place in that fight scared the shit out of John McCarthy because the minute you started cocking back with Bolander, and Bolander had you in a little bit of trouble, had you mounted, power out. The minute you started connecting a couple times, John McCarthy freaked out and stopped the fight. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I didn't notice that. I, and nobody told me anything. I didn't know until right now. That, but as soon as I got him in position, I hit him, I would barely touch him and then let it go. Stopped it right away. And um, going into the third fight against Don Fry, Don, at the time, managed by Dan Severn, his first fight was Thomas Ramirez, eight seconds. Sam Adkins, 48 seconds. You've got the one guy that is incredibly fresh in that third round. Yes. Um, Don Fry, um, Magnum PI looked, uh, looked pretty good. Um, I, like I said, I did not look at any of his matches. Uh, I was just focused on the first guy, Jer- um, not Jerry, um, Paul. Um, so when I got Jerry, it was great because he was smaller. So I was the the smallest Goliath was facing the the biggest um, the biggest David. So yeah. um, <laughs> yes, that's how it went. And off to work we go. Um, Jerry Bonelander fighting him for five minutes. Just I didn't train for cardio at all. I for some reason I skipped it that it was important. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got tired real quick. But Jerry, I was exhausted. <laughs> I came out of that match and I had to be dragged out. I was so damn tired. And but I thought pretty behind me, I'll get I'll get get up for uh, for done. So I got back there and I could hardly breathe and uh, I couldn't move. I I called um, Bob Myrowitz. He was he was running at the time. I said to Bob, Bob, I I can't fight no more. I'm done. I I, I can't do it. I'm gonna be just meat for somebody to come out and kick the piss out of me. So he said, Oh, there he came back in the, in the dressing room. Said, Gang. You've won uh, uh, 10,000 right now. If you don't fight, you get nothing. Somebody else takes your money. But if you win, you will win $50,000. He didn't have to say that twice. So, uh, <laughs> so I was fighting. I don't care anything happened. I was fighting. So uh, that's what happened. So, so Gary, with, with Don Fry, did you ever interact with his his trainer ever, Richard Hamilton at the time? Uh, no, uh, not before. After I, I heard a few, you know, things after them, you know, of course there's a after party and all this, this, so you get, you get maybe a little bit of squeaking talking here and there, but no, not really. Yeah. What an uh, inter- interesting guy. This. Like Puerto Rico sounds like in the history of the UFC, maybe one of the craziest shows. Like what was Puerto Rico like? Cause you got a language barrier. You got, you know, less regulation. If you yeah, and you're familiar with like the pro wrestling world, even the pro wrestling world has, you know, stories where actually people lost their lives in Puerto Rico. It's crazy down there. Do you remember any kind of nutty story like that? Uh, I've been to San Paulo lately. Sorry, go ahead. I said you've been to San Paulo lately. Yeah, <laughs> same. I, you know, when I, I when I fought down in San Paulo, I, I saw a lot of people in their yards with walking around with guns out. So yeah. Puerto Rico tough. I got it. San Paulo is no picnic either. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Sorry, Rico, Gary, go ahead. It was it was crazy. I saw it was crazy. It was just crazy. I, I, I at, at that time, you know, when you're not sure where you are, you tend to stay in your room because you're not sure where you are, the surroundings. Um, that happened to me a couple of times. You go in a strange country and you're not sure what's going on. You just be very vigilant of where you're going, who you're going with, and what's happening around you. So um, many times I went, I just went and stayed in my room because I didn't want to be caught up in a, any kind of BS. Or you could have hurt somebody's uh, somebody's fighter or you know their their hometown boy, so to speak. And then all of a sudden you're in a you're in a bar with them and you're drinking, you know. So I I I tend to stay out of those. Uh, situations just because you know i i understand i mean if if you beat my cousin or my brother or, or my buddy tom you know and i still want to kick the piss out of the guy that beat up tom 
um, it, it gets to you, you know. Um, well, here, I, Gary, come in second. The after yeah. party at that UFC is legendary for you know more than one reason, but a fist fight took place. No. Was it the next one? What about the Goas? Wasn't the Goas uh, yeah, Tank Abbott issue there as well? Yeah, the, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the fight that he, uh, he had a uh, fight at. I think Goas also had a fight. I think that may have been the next Puerto Rican event as well. It all may have been in one event. I apologize. UFC 9, Dance in Detroit. Um, your opponent kind of- was supposed to be Dave Benito. Yes, and I ended up fighting... Um, uh, what's his name? Mark Schultz. Mark Schultz. Oh, man. I felt really pumped up. And then I see Mark Schultz. And I'm like, man, that's a little guy. I'm going to kick his ass. And then, of course, that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, I I totally, uh, well, the, the guy that I was training with at the time, John Knapp, he was just tearing me up. He, I couldn't find a way to beat him. And then he says, well, you got this guy. He's going he's gonna to do this and do this and do this. But then when I saw him, Schultz, I said, ah, he ain't gonna beat me. He's just a little guy. So, um, sure enough, that was the exact opposite of what was going on, and I couldn't find myself to uh, anything that uh, that I could do to beat this individual. Uh, it was the, a big learning experience for me. So, the last minute switch, did they give you more money for that, or was your pay the same? I, I can't remember the the money was a pay, but um, it was uh, I think it was single fights. Was it single fights or no yeah. uh, tournament fight? And he was the first. Uh, yeah, um, did they pay me more money? I asked for more money simply because I can't. I did so well in the first one, so uh, that's how that went. So, so with with Mark Schultz, you know the rumor was the, the theory. I shouldn't say rumor. What's confirmed is Mark comes in last minute. On our podcast, Art Davey says we had to make a $50,000 donation to BYU in order to make sure that Mark could fight. Then we also gave Mark $50,000. Did you, are you aware that he got paid as much as Shamrock and in Severn in the main event? No, I did not. So no. the working theory is that Severn and Shamrock realized that they were getting paid just as much as. Dave Schultz, they deserved more, which is why they really didn't fight in that main event that night. They just kind of danced. Yeah. Makes sense. But uh, no, probably peanuts. Uh, I have no idea. You know, at at the time, you know, there was all sorts of strong men competition going on or bad men or, you know, had those uh, tough man competitions and, I just wanted to go out and beat a few people and go home, you know. <laughs> I didn't care. It wasn't about the money or anything. It was just about beating up a few people on TV. You know? It was just oh, wanted to beat a few <laughs> So the movie Foxcatcher, there's, if you listen to Joe Rogan, he, he mentions it often. He talks about the fight between yourself and Mark Schultz and about how the director changed the opponent and took you out of it. How does that make you feel to have been subtracted from that movie? Yeah, I, I think it bothers everybody else but me. Um, I'm bothered by it only because everybody says that. But uh, am I really bothered by it? No, I'm not bothered by it. If somebody wants to say they're Gary Gooders and Kerry, I don't give a shit. It doesn't bother me. Not. I mean, I would have liked it if you gave me some money for it, but really did it bother me? It didn't bother me. I, I haven't even seen the movie, but... Many people called me and told me about it or sent me a message. And uh, it it really, honestly, did not bother me. It's hmm. good. So at the rules meeting of UFC 8, was there an instance where they came in and told you that you could no, not strike the person except they did a kind of sleight of hand where you couldn't have closed fists, but they said, you know, you have to do it or you can do it? No, that was UFC 9. That yeah, was UFC- I apologize. UFC 9. Man, I yeah. don't know what's going on with me, Miguel. It's okay. Slipping. I know. Slipping. It happens every now and then. How old are you? Man, I'm 47. <laughs> I, I, here. I, I just did an event Friday, and I did an event Saturday. 
I just got home this morning. I am wiped out, but I'm not passing an opportunity to talk. All right. Thank you. Uh, is Tom. Tom. Um, anyways, uh, what, what happened was um, they came in and said, you got to punch people with an open hand. You, you can't hit them with a closed hand. You got to do this. With the, you can't really kick them in the head. You got to kick them in their ass. And just all sorts of stupid rules they got. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm thinking, what, what is this? Is this? Are we playing cops and robbers? Or are we are we fighting? Like, well, what's going on? So I didn't care. Well, pay me the money. I don't give a shit. You know, I, I can do anything. So I agreed to not punch the person in the head. And I'm so glad that I agreed to it because uh, Schultz had to agree to it too. If not, I, I would have looked like mince meat because, like I said, he was a wrestler, and I could not get him off me. It was like a wet blanket, like Tom Erickson on top of you. Couldn't get him off. Yeah, how Couldn't strong was Mark? Mark Schultz? Yes. Mark Schultz, uh, I don't know how strong he was, but in wrestling, he sure was damn strong. I couldn't think of how to get him off. <laughs> Now, did Fair it enough. affect you with the talk about, like, hitting with the open hands and stuff? I mean, it kind of takes one of your weapons away. Did that, once he got you down, that's the fight, you know, but did you feel like that slowed you up or, like, you couldn't react? No, it didn't slow me up. It didn't do nothing. Um, uh, once you were paying me, I didn't give a shit. It's all about the money at that point. You know, I think, can I hit him? Well, yeah, at the time, if I was fighting him, yeah, we were supposed to strike in the head. It wouldn't. It wouldn't have changed the fight any. He would not have gotten a uh, scratch on him um, because he was such a good wrestler that he took the fight away from me. Um, I was. I start the fight. He he starts the fight and I finish the fight. So he started the fight and would not allow me to finish. So he he was, you know, I I couldn't finish. So he finished. What was it like to be a sports writer? To be there for historical moments and unforgettable performances? Oh, there are stories. I'm Todd Jones, recovering from 30 years as a sports writer. Join me on Press Box Access. You'll hear from some of the best reporters and writers of the past 50 years about their experiences with the greatest athletes, coaches, and sports events. We tell stories behind the stories, some we've only told each other, and there's some laughs too. Let us buy you around on Press Box Access. Um, after that, I mean, Mark Schultz obviously weighed 203 pounds. You were 240. Big John McCarthy kept yelling open hands when Mark had the mount on you, which was yeah. kind of surprising. But you had a quick turnaround. They made sure you were at UFC 10 because you were a pretty big fan favorite at this time. Uh, yeah. John Camp Atella was your opponent. Yeah. I think John Camp Atella. I think John Campatella probably could have had a pretty bright future in the UFC. I'm not sure why he didn't stick with it. I thought he was pretty talented. John Campatella, um, probably <clears throat> now they have weight class, but to me, I, I thought he was too small. He was too small, and he had very limited wrestling skills. I, I could not see him on. If unless he's a brother, he will start talking nice, but. <laughs> Yeah, okay. You know, I, uh, it was um, John. Camp More of a bodybuilder type. I don't know what he was, but he wasn't a fighter. So he hit a uh, fireman's carry, yeah. a high school biology teacher, still teaching, I might add, and um, was out of Stanton Island, Vadaha Kenpo Karate. Yep. Yeah. I, I thought, like you had talked about, the little recency bias with with uh, John, Big John McCarthy. Yeah, I thought the train was going down the you know down the hill, but I thought yeah. that was stopped a little early as well, out of fear. Yes, uh, I think I was too. But had I known that John was going to do that uh, fireman's carry, he would end up the same way as Paul Era. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, he did the exact same move that uh, that uh, the, that the other did to me, and I caught him. But had I known, I would have waited for it and slipped him into it. He would have got a good night, Irene, too. So, Tom Erickson, fighting one of your uh, 
wrestling partners. Mark Coleman is the second round of uh, of this tournament. Um, Tom, were you watching the UFC at this time, or was it something that was kind of crossing your mind? Yeah, we started watching when Coleman start, started fighting in it. I, I remember uh, we'd be in training camps and stuff like that, and Severn was the first one that kind of jumped into it, not kind of, but you know, in terms of elite-level wrestlers. And I remember uh, Severn's coach, uh, Bobby Douglas, we were at camp. He was one of our coaches at camp, was saying how dangerous this would be, blah, 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 and telling Coleman how how he shouldn't get into this and everything else. And Coleman's just licking his chops because the one thing Coleman likes to do is fight. You know, get drunk, fight. I mean, that was him, random, and that's that's what they love to do. That's why he was so suited for it. And and uh, so, yeah, we got to watch. I think we were at training camp or something at one of the events when when Coleman was fighting in there. We're all kind of, you know, hooping and hollering. That's our guy, so we're, we're pretty excited for him. So, absolutely. Hilarious. That's hilarious. So, Mark Coleman, Gary, bring us through your experience with the hammer. Oh, man, the hammer was like um, like uh, Dave Schultz. It was just but bigger. Uh, he was just a nightmare. He was just a nightmare. And I had a bigger nightmare after that, too. Yeah, uh, Mark Coleman was just a nightmare. I, I couldn't do nothing. And then he was trying to headbutt me. He was trying to nail me with headbutt, so I opened my mouth to let him uh, put it on the angle so that if he headbutted me, he was going to cut his head in front of my teeth. But I free, forgot if he had me, I would have lost all my damn teeth. <laughs> but he never, he never paid attention to it. He just stopped the head button. He saw me doing that. Yes, I would have lost all my teeth. You landed a, uh, you landed a right hook right before the final takedown that looked pretty heavy. Did you think you had Mark? I don't think so. He told me about that, that too. You know, I, I, I honestly have not seen that match again. Um, I've not seen it, uh, but he, he tells me about that. <laughs> he tells me about it, but I, I don't recall it at all. I, I, Miguel, at this point, I think this is the first time we're obviously right now people are a lot more polished, but I think this is the first time you saw somebody in the cage just kind of vamp, do something different, and um, just start thinking while fighting. Because at one point in the cage, you're up against the fence. And Mark's got you pressed, and you realize you're in Mark's corner, so you kind of like fence crawled, you know, grabbing the fence to move the fight away from his corner, so you could be in yours. Yeah, that was incredibly like advanced for that time. Yes, yes. Um, anything to do? I was, I was. My corner was way on the other side of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the cage. So there was a Gary, come on over here. Come on over here, do that. I can hear them. So I started uh, French walking. Yeah, so I walked around the cage of mine and going on, he busted up my lip and smashed in my nose. So uh, yeah, it was <laughs> that was a that was a real a rough walk. Yeah. With Coleman <laughs> uppercutting you, yeah, from behind. Yeah, yeah, it was a rough walk. <clears throat> now Coleman and you though, Nate, you guys have a relationship now. You're friends now. Why don't you talk a little yeah. bit about cleaning up with Mark or, you know, becoming friends with him after fighting? Yeah, you know, I'm um, friend, I, I talked to him yesterday, to be honest with you. Um, I, I asked him, uh, I, I told him that me and Tom uh, and Maury Smith are going to Africa if he wants to come to Africa with me. And uh, he, he agreed to come with me. And uh, so, yeah, um, Tom, Tom, um, my first wrestling coach was Tom. Sorry, John Knapp. And then from there, it uh, was Mark Coleman and then Tom forever. Um, so Mark Coleman, uh, he was good. He, um, he, I enjoyed it. He was a good, knowledgeable. Um, he would just show you and hard. Show sure you had to do something hard. Um, that's what I remember about that, about our meeting. Um, he would just show you hard. Take you stay at his house and he'd take you over and show you something really hard and there it's just you couldn't yeah to put it together in your mind how to do it um but yeah he coached me he was uh, he was very good at what he did because when we went there was there were like six or seven guys and he'd go in and beat them all up and i'd watch and try did you, you, know, did you ever get a takedown against mark never i, I never got a takedown against anybody <laughs> That's <not fair. laughs> 
I was hoping you were going to lie because we had uh, Pat Militich on saying, of yeah. course, Matt Hughes got a takedown. Mark, Mark flipped out. You know, he doesn't like even in practice admitting no. to getting taken down. No, no. Top no. of yourself. Did you ever take Mark down in practice? Uh, I'll, I'll let him, I'll let him hold his glory and say no, but I'll say he never took me down the same way. So that's it. That's we, it. You know, we didn't really wrestle that much. We, we was kind of really refined. He was a 220 pounder and we were with the heavyweights. So we very rarely did we ever kind of cross up and grab each other. You know, one of the guys that I did kind of cross over just because <laughs> he's just that way was uh, Kurt Angle. I, I rolled with him a couple of times and, He's a little turn. He and I say this in a good way. He's got a little nice little duck under to the left side. He he hit me with a duck under and take me down and laugh at me. I want to get up and punch his ass. But uh, <laughs> Mark, I, I you know I can't I can't really call saying that you know Mark and I rolled that much. You know I, I you know I would think of it as two old bulls. You know you're not going to go and challenge yourself with somebody. So why uh, I think I could take him down and he thinks he could take me down. But eh, well, let's why try it if we don't have to. Yeah, Sims, Wes Sims told me. Yeah, Wes Sims obviously has rolled with both of you guys. Yeah. And I asked Wes about rolling with Tom, and he go, and he just said, imagine Mark Coleman with about another about 130 pounds on him. He's like, I've, you know, Mark, Wes is actually known for his, like, his, his strength. And yeah, he's yeah. just like, he's like, I felt like a child. He's like, I felt like I an think- absolute child. Wes got in trouble for saying something like that. If I remember, said something like that to Mark. Like, what, you think I'm not strong? <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And so, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Gary, you actually, you're in a role going through the UFCs, but you missed UFC 11. Was that, that was in, like in September of 1996. Was it because you were concentrating on the Yukon Jack arm wrestling tournament in Orlando, Florida? No, they were just tired of me. Really? They were just tired of me. They were just tired of me. You know? Okay, Gary, your turn out. Somebody else's turn in. They are just tired of me. Did, 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 wow. did they already talk to you about coming back at the end of the year for the big, like the ultimate ultimate, or was that yeah, something? That, um, I don't think they talked to me right then. They said all the pieces of people that won the tournament, the, the tournaments, and the second second in the rows after the seconds always are going to come back to have an ultimate ultimate uh, so i was in because they said that but uh, no they never did anything yeah. special okay well the ultimate ultimate is what in yukon jack tournament how did you do in a wrestling arm wrestling I tournament i beat i won to beat john john knapp and clink dean yeah or not now john brzink and clink dean sorry yeah john brzink and- yeah, I, I was watching some of your old arm wrestling videos. It's weird seeing you with hair. Yeah, yeah, quite <laughs> different. Yeah. Don Fry, Ultimate Ultimate, December 7th, 1996. Yeah. Um, that, obviously a rematch. Any concerns going into it? Um, no, I, I knew he was a journeyman in terms of uh, he can go forever and ever and ever. Okay. So I, I worked on my cardio a little bit more than I did the first one, which was none. Uh, so <laughs> I was, I was thinking, man, Don, Don Fry, I'm going to try to beat him this time. I'm going to kick his ass this time. Cause you have to play with your mind that you're going to win. You're going to win. You're going to win. You know, but my mind said, he can't, he beat me. He beat me. He beat me. So no, I'm going to win. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a struggle with your brain fighting against each other in order to win. So by the time I got in there, you know, I had in the back side of my brain was saying I'm gonna lose, and the front side was saying you're gonna win. So hidden, I hid it in my brain that I was gonna lose, and I tried to be up front that I was gonna win, but uh I lost. So the back one. So that actually was at eleven minutes twenty seconds. It was a valiant yeah. effort on your end. Oh man, I I just I really wanted to win that. I really wanted to win because he beat me so easy, like in the first time. I really wanted to win that. And it didn't happen. So, yeah, your I, brother was. Were you wearing a gi? Uh, I, I think at that point, no. I don't think I was wearing a gi then. I think yeah. I took. I was wearing the pants. Maybe so. I don't know. It, well, what was the like? What was the thought? Because like the gi, you know. 
made people maybe grab you. You know, it's associated with jujitsu, but like yeah. it worked for you, and and it also was part of your persona. Why'd you take it off? Well, I, I, I ain't gonna have that. I, I never wore a gi before. I remember the first time in UFC 8. I about that. Cook some wool. Yeah, tell them about that story. That's yeah. a good one. Uh, yeah, the Cook some wool is a story. But I uh, I seen friggin' uh, I seen Hoist Gracie wearing it and winning. That's what the hell? Who am I? I can win. I said, I'd wear the same thing and go in and choke out with it. But uh, obviously, it couldn't do that. You need more training. I had no idea until I got there. Awesome. <laughs> so how did you hook up with that cook still wine gym? Um when I saw the USC on, on TV, I went I went in the town that I was living in and uh uh I was work I was Fong Tran was the guy I was training with that told me, Hey, I'm gonna get you in the thing, USC and so I, I started training with him and he was at uh, the Cook Sul Wan school. So uh, he took me over there and and uh, told the guy I was going to fight. So he gave me a gi and he gave me black belt. And he said, okay, go on out. Join, use the club. So I could use the club. I could train in the club. And just as so long as I represented Cook Su Wan. So that's what I did. I, so they gave me a fourth degree black belt. Now, you were also training at Bob Houston's Martial Arts Academy. Bob Houston. Bob Houston. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I never, I went there, I think, once. I went there once, and Bob's a great guy. Uh, I, wow, that, that's going way back. Come on, bro. Yeah, Bob's a, you're good, man. Bob Houston, yeah. He's a cop now. Is he really? He's a cop now, yeah. Okay. How do you know? Um, him? Go ahead. Hey, Mike does his research. I did a research, all right. Yeah, no, yeah. I Gary, that's kind of our hook here. I if you have an ex-girlfriend that wants to stalk you, I would like uh, to match her and the uh, research they found. So it's kind of what makes our podcast special. Like uh, stuff yeah, like man. that. Um, that's why we forgive when he mixes up UFC eight and nine. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Miguel. I, I'm playing tiredness, but truth be told, Gary, like in high school, I took all my books to the same room. Like when a bell rang, I just I was told to stay. I wasn't allowed to leave. Uh, uh, <laughs> so Universal Valley Tito, March 3rd, 1997. You fought an eight-man tournament promoter, Sergio Bottarelli. Yeah. How was it fighting for him? Well, Bottarelli, again, you know, it was when you fight away out of your country, or, well, I, I consider America our country, too. But uh, when you fight away from your country, what happens is that how you get weary about people around you, people being able to get to your room, knowing where you're sleeping. You get weary. You'll get an uneasy feeling about that. When I went down to Sergio Battelli, I mean, I went, I went down with Brian Johnson and and uh, what's it, um, Don Fry and a couple other people, and you're just not sure what's going on around you, and then you got to be sure about who you tell them where you're sleeping because it um, Brazil's a pretty sketchy place it's a pretty sketchy and scary place you know so um you weren't sure about anything nobody ever told you about it but you just you just the ambiance it's just what's going on around you just and now now that I did now that I know Brazil and know of Brazil it was a good thing I did that because it's not uh it's not a friendly place <laughs> no it's the same event that Kevin Randleman fought on, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. So when Randleman fought Ebenezer Braga, a couple of the Brazilians were pulling Kevin under, or pulling Braga underneath the ropes to get yeah. him away from Kevin so they could restart it. Uh, yeah. Coleman almost fought the entire section of crowd yeah. behind yeah. him twice that night. It's fantastic yeah. watch on video. It's on YouTube. So, go ahead. I have a question for you, Gary. Now, UFC, you fought UFC 8, 9, you know, those were no, basically no rule fights, you know, back in those days. There seemed to be a difference, though, in Brazil. Like the Valley Tudo, I don't know if it was rougher or if the guys that you fought were, you know, maybe willing to die more. Like, was that part of it or was it really, you know, were was the rules intimidating and maybe they won't enforce them well because it's Brazil? Like, how did that play in, or was it really just strictly the cultural? 
it was just the culture, just uh, and you know, I don't think they they don't really care about anything. Uh, in America, you care about the cops. You care about what's going to happen. You care about jail. I, I I found that to me, it seemed like uh, they didn't give a shit about that. You know, if they're going to fight, they're going to fight. They're, they're like um, human pit bulls. Got angry at the drop of a dime. Wow. With Mario Neto, and Mario Neto is, is a fantastic story. I, we're tracking him down very soon. Mario Neto, it, it seemed like you got two, you, you took two hard punches and you tapped out. It was a really strange end to the fight. Mario Neto. I lost that fight? Yes, you tapped out. Yeah. You know what? I was drained. I was drained on that fight, yes. Sometimes you, you're on a fight, and, and I don't know, but you just drain yourself. I was drained. I was drained after about and two minutes into that fight, I had nothing. I had really? nothing. I couldn't fight with anything. If you watch a fight, you can see. Um, two minutes in that fight, I was just completely drained. Um, you pump yourself so much in the back that when you come out and fight, you're just completely drained. And it was one of those times. I'm sure I could tell you, Sean could, um, Tom could tell you about wrestling, you know. You pump yourself so much in the back that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. You get yourself all geared up. So when you come out, you're, you're flat. Instead of running on 80, 90, you're running on like uh, 20, 30. If that makes any sense. Okay. Now, Tom, you had fought in Brazil. What did you think that the ambiance was like? Uh, it, it was crazy. It was laid back. Uh, and we had Chipperelli was, was, was my guy. And he had trained with Henzo and, and the different the factions and stuff like that. Uh, and he said, everything's late. Uh, I remember going to the venue, I don't know, about 7.30, 8 o'clock. And we didn't fight till about 11.30. We, we didn't, I didn't fight the final match against Randall until after midnight. They just slowly come in. Uh, but one of the things you know about Brazilians, man, they're passionate. They, 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 they love you passionately. They hate you passionately. <laughs> and if they hate you, they, they will storm the cage. If, if um, in that event, I think it was either Henderson's fight or, uh, gosh, was it Smith? fought from the hammer house they had to change eric smith, eric, eric smith fought Pele and then dan henderson and, and and then they had to change the referee if you notice they changed the referee because they were going to storm the cage and pull the referee out so they ended up putting yamazaki in there at the end i think with mario was at the end there but he wasn't the referee that started the fights if you watch all four of the, the, the different fights you'll see there's a different referee that starts the fights and before this it, it's not the same guy that finishes the fights because they were going to pull him out because they didn't like a decision or like a stand up or something like that. Okay. Where they were going to pull that guy out. Okay. Just, I mean, we're kind of going down a different path right now, but this is, yeah. this is serious yeah. history right here. So the serious history that Tom's just talking about, Tom, that's fantastic. Eric Smith. Okay. Pele Landis fights Joe Hill de Oliveira loses after taking like 98 headbutts. And this is kind of like the prodigy of his school. His comeback fight, where you know he's in phenomenal shape, is an O and O Hammer House guy named Eric Smith, who in like eight or nine minutes lays a beating that nobody like it's even worse than Joe Hill. So you got a blue chip prospect going O and two in his hometown, and the crowd, to that crowd, they were gonna they were trying to attack anybody. That was a very yeah. very crazy event. Um, Those side note, Mario Neto, Wolf Slayer, and Europe and England is his gym. He's, he's done a fantastic job. July 6th, 1997, International Valley Tudo, Brazil, Brazil, another eight-man tournament, Augusto Menzes. Do you recall him? Menzes Santos? Gary? No, I don't, I don't recall him at all. Not another at all. crucifix. Yeah. I gave him a crucifix? You know, there's no video on it. It's that's all that's listed. Oh, on the oh yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you just had to say that. The water. Yeah, this guy. No, that was the Pedro. I was thinking about the, the Pedro when I when I started that's making right. peanut butter. When I was making peanut butter. <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? He's talking, Tom. 
Two in the nut grab here. Let's just skip. Here we go. Pedro Octavio, the Pedro in the finals, 1650. Um, he beats Brian Keck from Hammer House in 1824. Incredibly exhausting fight. Uh, Andrea Cardoso beats him with an Achilles lock at 841. And he runs into you in the finals. Um, how difficult was that fight? When did you decide to resort to grabbing another man's package? Okay. What happened was he fought 30 minutes his first fight. 30 minutes. His second fight, pretty damn close to that as well. So by the time he came to me, he was already damn tired, right? So so we, I, my first match was relatively quick. My second match was quick as well, too. So, uh, so I, was, I was relatively fresh. He was relatively tired. So what happened was, um, I don't remember how the fight started, but there's, there goes out about making peanut butter. And this is the truth. I don't mind what anybody else tells you. What happened was we got into a position and uh, I was in the guard and I got my foot caught in his, uh, in his, his, his pants. And I could have took it out. I said, no, nah, leave it in there because I can, I can push back on him and bring him forward, right? I can push him back so he's further back and bring him forward when I want with, uh, with the short. You did it to me in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, what the hell? I'm just going to use it. So then the referee restarted us and the, the, the pushing him back and his jock was still in my head. So I thought, man, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna slip his jock to the side, then pow, like just hit him in the in the ball and just crush everything. So my mind is thinking, we get up. I say I want to get in the shorts. If I get in the shorts, I can crush him because there's no rules. There's no rules over there. So you can do it to you. There was there was no rules. They they said that's how they got me there. They called me up and they said, Gary, would you like to come to the tournament? And fight and I, one night. I said, yeah, well, yeah who, who am I fighting? I said, well, you're fighting at a tournament then, and we're going to give you a blah, 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 blah. So I said, okay, yeah. I said, what's the rules? He says, there's no rules. I said, oh, wow. I'm on my way to Los I'm on the way to Brazil. There's no rules. So I got there and I want to smack the guy in the crotch. And I'm going to pull his, his, his underwear to the side, his uh, jock to the side so it rests on it. So I can just like I said, crush it. So I'm, I'm trying to push to the side, I'm trying to push to the side. And um, then he drops to the ground, ah! holding his package like I did something. I I didn't touch your crotch. I was in there trying to push the judge to the side. But he carried on like if I did that for his stuff. And uh, Sergio, the guy that was running, they said, well, keep going, keep going. There's no rules, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up winning that fight because he just hung on to his crotch. I ah, started crying. So Gary, Freaking you were bitch. positioning the package, not grabbing. Yes, that uh, yeah, I made some peanuts. I make fun of it now. Is that big me? difference? Of course. Who cares? It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, who cares? Yeah. I got paid. I got my twenty thousand. I was happy, you know. But absolutely. So let it be known. Hey, let it be known that how I did not squeeze his nuts at all. I, I'd say now yeah, I squeeze his nuts, but I didn't squeeze his nuts. I went down in his shorts, like I said, to push the cross to the side, and I smack it. I wanted to smack the smack and pinch his dick off, but I, I, I didn't try to. Yeah, that's what happened. This is kind of like one of those I didn't inhale moments. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Now I I know the Pedro and. Like he's bizarre, berserk over this, you know, because it was sort of like an embarrassing thing. Was there, did you talk afterward? Like, what was the reaction in Brazil? Because they'd never seen anything. Like, I know they do no rules, but they'd never seen anything like that. Yeah, yeah. He is a punk. <clears throat> so, he Miguel, cool. we started talking about Brazil with you saying it's just different, it's cultural. They're, they're very passionate, they like to fight, they like to love. Yeah, I think Gary showed him what levels are all about with that. Was. And I think, um, <laughs> on, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Mark Coleman was with me. He was watching my back at that time. Man, we had to grab the money and get the hell out of that place as soon as possible. Go back to our rooms. No party in the night. <laughs> wow, no party oh, yeah. in the 
<laughs> oh, yeah. No partying tonight, man. We got to stay in our room. So my, but let's my, 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 go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. He, the, the one thing that's surprising, and there's no video, I really wish there was, the one thing that absolutely was shocking, Cal Worsham's on the card. You beat Cal Worsham in 43 seconds with a key lock. Yeah. Cal uh, Worsham was legit. Yeah. What the are you, what, what are you training your jiu-jitsu at? The thing that happened with Cal Worsham there, and I'll tell you the truth. Um, we know we're going to fight. He says, well, how much are you going to pay me for me to lose? I said, what do you want? So he said, well, I, so then we came up with a number. I really don't remember what the number is. He said, I'll tap to you. I'll tap for you. Okay, tap for me. That's the truth. Wow. So yeah, fight Cal Worsham, but we didn't even rough and tumble. It just, it was like 30 seconds. That's a good move. I mean, there, I mean, there's a lot of, they do that in Abu Dhabi. It's, you know what I mean? It's, I, I have no idea what they, what they do, but I know that in order to get me to the finals, that's what Kyle did. And, I, and yeah, I won that tournament. Yeah, I yeah. won that. I got the yeah, belt no, for I, it. I think Gary's been pretty honest about it where, you know, some guys like Coleman would probably be doing this for free. You know what I mean? But Gary was in it for the money. It was a payday. Yeah. <clears throat> that's fantastic. Miguel, this gentleman fought on the very first Pride, October 11th, 1997. A historic moment for mixed martial arts. Oleg Tiktarov was your opponent. Obviously, everybody knew who he was. And I think you may have came in as an underdog. Oh, man. I was so afraid. I was shaking in my space boots when I'm fighting this guy. But he was so tiny. I couldn't believe such a tiny guy was going to give me a rough go. But he beat Tank Abbott. Whoa, that Tank Abbott was knocking giants out with one punch. Huh? I, couldn't, I couldn't see how this guy individual was going to beat me. But I was so afraid of, uh, of this thing happening that uh, I just went out there. And it was just all, everything was instinctively. And I, I was moving quick because I was just fair. Fair, um, fair overtook me. It made me, sometimes fair can, uh, can be your worst enemy. And other times, fear can be your best friend. And at this time, this particular fight, it was my best friend. So, yeah, Tektarovic this time, Miguel, Tektarovic this time, he's a Sambo guy. I mean, there, there's no doubt about that. Good upper body takedowns, leg locks, but he's always flat footed. He goes and trains at Wildcard Gym with Freddie Roach yeah. and falls in love with stand up against a monster hitter like, like Gary Goodrich. Yeah. Gary, why don't you tell us how that fight ended? Okay, um, uh, you know, it, it was actually quite, I think, I think it only lasted eight minutes. But uh, so what it was is him and I were just dancing around and um, I hit him and it scratched him open. I think he got scratched on the nose and started bleeding a little bit. Nothing major. Oh, sorry, on the side of the head. And um, I just, I was afraid to get involved with him too close. He again went on the ground. And uh, somehow I was up and I kicked him in the face, broke my foot in his head. I couldn't believe it. I broke my foot. So I'm, I'm like walking around with my foot all busted up. And uh, it wasn't very much fun. It hurt like a son of a bitch, but I had to play. I had to have a poker face. So I, I kept the poker face and um, he stood up and I just swung with everything I had to try to take his head off. And, and he fell down. And it was bad. As soon as I hit him after, I felt bad. I felt bad as soon as I hit him because it was so damn hard. Um, it almost made me cry because uh, what I did, you know, I, I just uh, never, even to this day, I never hit a man that hard. Holy shit. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me ask you, the, how was, because in Japan, you mentioned the Brazil was a little bit intimidating or that it wasn't comfortable. Now, is Japan different because, like, a guy like you, larger than life kind of thing, like, people love you over there, and you feel yeah. safe and loved, and they take care of you. Was How, how do you describe the Japan experience? Well, with Japan, is, it, is that the thing, the thing with Japan is that how they didn't, with me, they didn't care if I won or lose. They liked my spirit, that I kept on going, and I kept on going. Don't kick my ass, and I keep going. I kept going back and going back and trying and trying and trying. That's what they liked about me. So I won. That's why I won half the fights and lost half. 
Um, you know, even Tom kicked my ass. They're pretty good. Um, Mark kicked my ass. They're pretty good. I, just everybody kicked my ass. And the, <laughs> people, the new guys that came in, I kicked their ass. So um, I was a journeyman in that fighter. I was, um, what do they call it now? Um, gatekeeper. I wasn't, I wasn't, yeah, the I was gate, the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper. Yes. So I, I was I was not the GOAT. Tam, how was your experience in Japan? Uh, I loved it, man. It was, it was educating. I mean, very educational, so to speak. I mean, you know, when you go to the hotel, you're mobbed. You know, they meet you in the airport. And, and after, obviously, the first couple of times, they didn't know who the hell I was. But after you've been there a couple of times, fought there a couple of times, they're seeing you in the airport. They're like, oh, oh. You know, I remember walking in there with Gary multiple times. They touch you like, oh, 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 oh. You know, I'd be really scared. But, uh, you know, you watch the fights. You know, you're back in the States and I had fought, you know, several times. You go down to Brazil and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, in the States, it's kind of barroom. Oh, kick his ass, break his arm. In Japan, very respectful. We're in the uh, Saitama Super Arena, 20, 30,000, whatever. They're in there and, it's, and the crowd is quiet and a murmur. But then you, you lock in a submission or you catch somebody, you connect with a punch. And all of a sudden the crowd starts amping up because they know a finish is coming. And it just it's just... You know, and I've wrestled my whole life and had a lot of success wrestling and stuff like that, but it was really cool to be treated like a rock star. I mean, that, and that's what it was. I mean, you know, obviously it's it's a Yakuza. So, you know, there, there was big money people taking care of you the right way. You know, we, we stay at the Tokyo Hilton, a uh, beautiful place. I mean, they just just, just treated us like royalty. Um, you know, that, that's why in the early days, you know, Pride, you know, UFC paled compared to Pride. I mean, the UFC was a local gin joint fight, fight club compared to what Pride was. Incredible shows. I mean, there isn't a guy on this in, in this four p- p- pictures I'm looking at that, that can't tell you that the Pride knew how to put on a show. The pyrotechnics, the, the displays and everything else just, just were incredible. And, and so, man, so, you, you fought harder for it. I was just going to ask you to confirm when you went to Japan, did they fly you business class or, or coach? Who me? I, at first I was coach. And then after, after I won a couple of fights, it was all business class. You were, you're getting, you know, one in three or something like that. You know, you get one business class and three coach class tickets and movies and per diem, you know, and as you won, you, you, you increased it. You know, Gary's the one that taught me that, you know, I, I, I mean, one, no, seriously, this is, you, you, and I know Gary has some things going on in, in his life right now with some different things, but that is one of the smartest guys I know in the fight game. And he taught me so much in terms of how to negotiate, how to get in the ring, how to act, how to talk trash and stuff like that. And, 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 and how to t- just listen to him. He's thinking about doing these things so he can one crush your nuts or get you off Gary, the game. G- yeah. Gary, you just think genius. you think in the fight and at this point, it's so advanced compared to everybody else. I mean, and anywhere in the world, did you, uh, I mean, obviously Tom had mentioned the Yakuza. Did you notice any of those people at Pride One? Did you kind of know it was a little nefarious at that time? No, I, I didn't I didn't really pay attention to any of that. Um, but yes, you can see it prevalent uh, as you go on. When did it kind of dawn on you that the Yakuza was heavily involved? Um, Further on in, in my career with that, um, because you just see guys hanging around and and people tell you, oh, that he's Yakuza, um, that from Japan there. Um, so to work to work for Pride, um, and for K One, you know, Yakuza was involved. It was Yakuza money. Oh, that's interesting, now, Marco. Now, who else? Well, hold on. Just sometimes a lot of the treatment there, the way they take care of you is. You know, especially a guy like you, I want to say larger than life. You know, later on, you know, Mark Coleman did like banana commercials dressed up as like a banana and stuff like that. Did you ever do TV commercials or any of that type of media like uh, adulation they give you? Yes, I did. Strongman competitions and stuff over there. Uh, It was was awesome. Yes, I did. uh, I did. a uh, commercial for shaving, uh, commercial for this, commercial. Uh, yeah, we did a few commercials, just about three commercials. Okay, and, and how about pro wrestling? Pro wrestling, I did two two cards, yeah, two different cool, things. Cool. 
that's another excellent. way they kind of take care of you is they bring you back for other little gigs and things. Yeah. And that's good. You got to grab your money, man, you know? So you fight Marco Huas, King of the Streets, Luta Libre legend, residing in California right now. You lose to a heel hook in that, in, in that fight. But prior to the submission, it looked like you stepped awkwardly and may have compromised your ankle. Is that true? I don't think so. Um, I was just in awe of Marco Ross, to be honest with you. I was in awe of him. So when when he did put me in anything, it was okay. I, I knew you were going to get me. Go ahead. Um, but I, at, that, at that point in my career, I was like, it's about the payday. So if you pay me right, I'll do whatever. If you pay oh. me wrong, I'm being, it's, things are going to be different. I'm, maybe I don't even want to fight. But um, it was all about the payday. It really was always pay me money. But if I had to pick a moment where you really made, you cemented your legacy in Japan, it was at Pride 3 against Amir Ran Ab RC. Uh, Miguel, I just said that phonetically because I'm never going to get through it. Um, you were in his full guard and you hit him with like three right hands that I thought were the hardest punches I've ever seen from guard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just talked to him yesterday. Uh, we still keep in touch on the internet, on Facebook. Uh, you know what? Amir, Amir took that fight um, like Tom and I used to. After, you know, he got the fight on the way over to, the, uh, to Japan. He was cornering somebody else. On, the way, on his way over to the Japan, he got the fight. So, um, but when, when he got in there, he, he wasn't supposed to be fighting. So he just jumped in there on his own. So, uh, hats off, kudos to him. But uh, if I was him, I would have never done anything like that. But no, I did do many things like that. <laughs> you know, I felt many, so, you know, pay right, you can do anything. And that, that's really what it's good about. Uh, Amir, hats off to him, man. He fought his balls off, and he did pretty good. So around this time, your family starts kind of getting involved with your career. And the one thing about your family that I had thought was your brother was doing bodyguard work at this time. Yeah. Did he ever contemplate coming over into mixed martial arts? It was Garvin. It was my cousin. There was two of them, two cousins. Uh, it was Garvin. Uh, uh, he was he, he contemplated fighting, but never really got into it. Um, bodyguard, he contemplated that, but never got into it as well. But oh uh, yeah, it was, it was whatever. Never and, and, and your sister would come out with you as well. Did she, she ever went, think about fighting? Um, oh, she thought about it, but that's that's as far as she wanted to go. She's a rough, tough cream puff. Okay, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. All right, we have a list of people that have never won world championships that are probably like the top three, Pedro Hizzo being one of them, Gray Maynard being another, a, a, a different one. The last on that list, Igor Volchenshin. That's oh, your man. next opponent at Pride 3, or Pride 4. What a savage fight. Uh, Igor Volchenshin. And you forgot Tom Erickson's on my list too. <laughs> Guys, <that> never <laughs> we're getting to Tom. <laughs> yeah. No worries, no worries. Igor just, was one bad um, dude. Mm. End of story. It was like, wow, how did he beat me? Like, what happened? But you know, was he, I, I fought him twice, and twice he beat me. I, 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 both times, I'm like, how did he beat me? He was, he was just a little dude. It was a shot off shotgun. And he beat me twice. You weren't happy with the stoppage on the first one, though. Uh, I, I don't remember. I just knew he kicked my ass, and I didn't like it. Okay. All right, you hit the grind, the pride, January 30th, 2000. One of the greatest events in mixed martial arts history is the Pride Grand Prix. You fought in the opening round. They did you a pretty big solid against Asamu Kawahara, a sumo pro wrestler, six foot five, 297 pounds. This is kind of like the freak show era of Pride. Let me tell you, man, that guy, let me tell you about that guy. That guy was in the back room smoking a cigarette before the match. <laughs> he was in the back room smoking a cigarette. I'm like, what the fuck? 
This guy's smoking a cigarette in the back room. When we got in the fight, I smelled nothing but smoke. So, Maybe he was trying to beat you that way. I don't know, man. He knew you had issues with cardio. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but it was it was incredible. Like, how can you be in the back room? You're an, you're, you're an athlete. You're being a paid athlete in the back room smoking a cigarette. But he was Maybe doing it. <laughs> So, I, so I, got, Gary, I got a quick question though. Go Hold on. After the Marco Ruiz fight, you fought uh, both Chanchin and Ron Marty. Then you went back to UFC. You had a fight with Andre Roberts. How did the contract negotiations go between Pride UFC? Like at this point, you're a special guy. You're one of those guys that is a big name. But how did you manage to do both shows like that? I have no idea. People called me and uh, I said, yeah. Um, as a one fight, I, I, uh, the contract I signed every time with a USC was one fight. Um, and then we agreed after the fight, I would go to see if I made another fight. So they, um, they offered me the fight with Andre Roberts. I flew back then. I fought Andre Roberts and, uh, they had an open to have me fight again, but they never did. Cause the, then when you went back to Japan for pride six, Man, and now you fought. Now you're really. This may be where you that yakuza moment because you fought Ogawa, and yeah. he's one of those wrestler crossover guys who's like, you know, like a big body for them. So like they treat him like larger than life. Was there any funny business with that fight? No. Uh, yes, there was. What happened was um before the fight, the guy their own pride came and said to me, Gary, if you beat this guy. You write what you make. You're going to write your paychecks, your own paychecks. And I'm like, wow, you're going to make a lot of money if you beat this guy. But you have to beat this guy. If you beat this guy before the match, that's the worst thing he could do. He did that to me. Beat this guy and you get everything. That was in my head. So I go out there and I'm going to fight him. I'm like, ah, all over the place. Blew my wad in 30 seconds because I was done. I wanted to beat this guy. And if they just had left me alone, it would have done, I'm not saying I would have beat him, but it would have been better. Maybe I could have. But because of what was told to me, got me too excited. When I went out there, it was just boom, done in 30 seconds because there's just so much. I have to do this. I have to do that. Oh All my God. Everything in my head went out, it went out the window. That was the worst thing you could ever do to a fighter or to a wow. professional team or whatever, wrestler, you name it. The worst thing you could do. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And we go, we're, we're skipping fights. We're trying to get his whole career on this one thing. But if there's any other things like it, please point them out. Um, well, at my order. really fast. And the very sure. next one is the fight with Tom. And I know Gary kind of wanted to talk about that. So absolutely. And, and, Number okay. eight. So now, how did that come about? Because, you know, we got Tom was, like you said, and you're not, it's not a joke. Tom was a nightmare to match. They're very hard to get him fights and Wait, Miguel, stuff like that. So what did you do? Some, what, some people that? argued that Tom was best in the world uh, pound for pound at that time. This is like when Wes Sims and I were very close friends and Wes would tell me Tom Erickson is the best in the world at this point. That's his words. We, we, we met, I think, even when you brought me on one of my times before that, we, the first time I met Gary was in Montreal, I think IFC or something like that. Uh, Vladimir, uh, the janitor, fought... Uh, Matt Yushchenko. Yep, fought Vernon. Vernon White in that event and, and beat Vernon at that event and stuff like that. And uh, it was funny because I, I, I met Shamrock that night too and he acted all chippy or whatever. But I, I met Gary. Gary was super nice. And next thing you know, we're, we're fighting in Pride 8. That was, that was crazy. <laughs> but I think he knew it, man, because Gary's all playing all side, kind of side. Yeah, so up. Gary. Like I said, that's the sharpest guy right there, man. He, he does some sneaky fight stuff. With Tom Erickson. Tell, tell us how you took it easy on him, please. <laughs> yeah, he did. Didn't take it easy on Tom. I really wanted to beat Tom. Every everybody I step in the ring with, I want to beat. I wanted to beat Tom, and I, when I realized I couldn't outfight him, he wouldn't let me box. Um, 
I was I was on the ground. I started to talk to him and and kiss at him and stuff just to to throw his try to throw his mind off what he's what's doing or just get it going kissing and doing all that shit back to me so it'll give me an opportunity but because he just he just ignored all that and kept on beating my ass shame on you Tom yeah uh, shame on you (laughs) (laughs) love hurts love hurts yeah (laughs) all right a lot of love to give that's for sure yeah Miguel I got a couple more fights with him. I've obviously got some other questions, but pick through his record. Please pick through his record because, Gary, we weren't sure, like, uh, how happy you would be or how, how gnarly you would be. So I just picked, a, you know, a few of my favorites. So we appreciate you, you hanging in with us, man. This is fun. Pride Grand Prix, May 1st, 2000. When did you find out the lineup? Did they give you, like, four weeks out? Did they tell you where you were at, where you were fighting? Pride Grand Prix, um... I, I can't remember. I really can't remember. I'd lie if I told you. I think they told you, I, w- I would imagine two weeks out. I imagine two weeks out or when you got there. So you fight Igor Bochenshin again yeah. in the opening round opponent. Yeah. Um, this is when, Gary, sometimes karma comes into play. Yeah. And I think that the Pedro nut grab, um, yeah, I, I think the powers that be, delivered uh, a nut shot from the gods and destroyed your cup and uh, you somehow fought through it <laughs> Why don't you talk to us about that that was incredible um <laughs> this guy and he comes up and he hits me in the dick um well where it should be and he dented in my cup do you guys remember that you see that he dented my cup there was a rest down in the cup so um, the, the referee said, let's go back. Go, go ahead. I said, no, 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 stop. Brought the referee's hands, hands in my crotch. Let him feel what's going on. So he felt the, 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 the dip that, you know, <laughs> it, it, it bent down. So when he crushed it, it came out, went up, grabbed my stuff, and put it back in. So I'm, right now, I'm, a part of my scrotum's in the, in the, in the break, holding on to it with a, like, like a rubber band he's holding it there so it's, it's so I, I couldn't do nothing it, it hurt so I, I had to bring the referee's hand to it then he said oh, oh. then he got people because I couldn't talk to him it wasn't it wasn't English called the people have them, so they put me in a thing pull my um, my penis apart to get the, the the thing from from closing in on it and uh then I was able to fight but yeah I, had, I was bleeding pretty good after that Miguel, it was a wardrobe. It was a wardrobe change. Like Gary comes out underneath the ropes. You know, it's whatever that game is families play where they, they have to use their body language to describe things. It's very interesting to, to see Gary describe that his balls were trapped in his cup. It's fantastic. Yeah. It is like, it's, it's excellent. So they put the towers around you. It's a whole bunch of like Asian referees. It's almost like something out of the WWE. Going like this. Yeah. It's like I went into you know pro wrestling, other referees run out of the locker room to kind of save the day. That's what took place. It took a village to put that cup and in, in, in back in order so you could continue fighting. That was not good. <laughs> that was painful. That was painful. Now at this so, point, so you're really on Pride's roster though, because oh, dude, they love him. Yeah, not the not giving up thing worked. Uh, just. And not give up and keep fighting hard. That's all they want. After Igor Vicente goes on to the finals against Mark Coleman, um, after beating Sakuraba, it fought 25 minutes. And um, it, it, Vicente, to his credit, won four eight-man tournaments and, and made it to the finals of one 16-man tournament. Um, have you spoken to Vicente lately? No, I haven't seen him since, uh, since in Japan. He's in like the Ukrainian stuff. They say he's into some some pretty crazy things. I, I try to track him down. Were you surprised that Coleman won a Grand Prix that night? Um, not really. Uh, wrestling was so strong at that time to, to win. Um, that point in MMA, wrestling was so dominant in what they were doing that how you were, if you fought a wrestler and you're ninety percent going to lose. Elite wrestling. Yeah. Elite wrestling. Who did you would have think would have won between Mark Kerr and Mark Coleman, Gary? 
Probably Mark Coleman. Tom? Coleman. You guys say that with a, an era, like an aura of, of very positive, very positive. I told, I told you before I've done interviews, Col Coleman loved to fight. Col 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 was he the best? I, I, no, he'll probably kill me for saying, no, he, he's not the best. He loved to fight. Mark loved to get paid. Now, Gary, Gary liked to get paid. I like to get paid, but he's willing to fight for it. Uh, I'm willing to fight for it. Kerr fought when it was comfortable for him and liked to get paid. And he was very skilled, and that's why he did well. But Coleman loved to fight. So in our John Fitch interview, <clears throat> one of your students at, at Purdue, he had said that you were doing this fight thing, and it was just more kind of supplementing your lifestyle. You didn't really go into it all in, and your, most of your training camps were in a Purdue wrestling room. Is, is that true, Tom? Yes. Now, so, some of those camps, we brought Kerr and Wes. Wes came over to our place one time and yeah. trained in a, a training cycle. Gary would come down and train with me. Uh, I, I would actually, Gary is kind of partly the guy responsible for ruining my career, too. He, he, uh, really, he Gary? Up, he, he brought me up to baseboard, and that was a little training camp, a military training camp up there. And we train up there, but he, uh, he started teaching me how to work my hands. I used to hit heavy, but I learned how to punch. I learned how to kick. Gary taught me. Well, his, his people and stuff like that, Paul Minhas and his crew up there, uh, Ultimate Muay Thai, they, they kind of started training me how to, how to use my hands and Chris the snap, et cetera. And, and man, ain't nothing better than knocking a dude out. Uh, and, and you start forgetting some of your roots and uh, uh, I still like my chances again about anybody, but whatever. For sure. Gary, yeah. w one of the interesting things in your career that I, I could find, and there's very little on it, um, you were supposed to fight Butterbean in Yama and Mark Pavlich from MFC, I think sent his legal team in order to, stop that fight from taking place what exactly happened in that situation i have no idea um i, I didn't really want to fight butterbean either because uh it, it was going to be a hard fight um and i i didn't want to fight him it was it was going to be a hard fight and I, and I really never i've never ducked anybody i didn't duck butterbean either but that was going to be a hard fight you're, you're that, that fight where you were going to get knocked out Am I afraid to get knocked out? No, I didn't. It didn't bother me. Am I afraid to get a beat? No, it didn't bother me. It was just, it was just going to be a hard fight. And yeah, they asked me if we take the fight. I said, yeah, absolutely, let's go. Uh, they said okay to me. I said okay, and then they went to his corner. It wouldn't, it wouldn't fly. Carter being, I, I think, is undervalued as a tough competitor. Very that much. guy hit like a brick, like a brick shit house. Uh, when, when he fought Cabbage Korea the first time, Cabbage Korea was like, I'm not taking you down, Butterbean. We're going to stand and trade. And Butterbean's like, yeah, I think you're lying to me. And a Cabbage stood and trade with him and got knocked out. And this was a fight where Butterbean had to take his mouthpiece out so he can spit the shards of his teeth out that, that Cabbage Korea knocked out. And Cabbage Korea obliged. Go ahead, fix yourself. When you're ready, let me know. Butterbean Korea, it, one is an incredible fight. Uh, Eric Esch. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Eric Esch. <laughs> Mike Bernardo, you guys did a K1 fight. Yeah. The first time you I came in as a, you two time. Yes, in, as well as Shannon Briggs. When you fought Mike Bernardo the first time, you came in as a heavy underdog. They brought you in just to kind of serve you up and with a big upset, you you stopped Bernardo. Yeah. What was the locker room like afterward? Because from what I understand, it was heated. Oh yeah, it was. Uh, it was heated, uh, undecided of uh, win or loss. It, it was undecided because a lot of people that uh, that loved him, that trained with him, was in the same dress room. So yeah, it was a little heated, but say la vie. Well. For the rematch, you made sure you had Coleman and Erickson in your corner. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Was it for support, or did you guys think? No, man. He said I had to watch my back. He said I had to watch my back. You know what that was going on? Can you that, imagine that, Erickson and Coleman watching yeah. your back? Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. 
Yeah. Tom, wait, wait, Tom. What do you remember about those fights? Uh, didn't like him. Didn't like Bernardo. Didn't like his camp. He, um, yeah, he, he's deceased. You know, God rest his soul. I, so much, much respect. You know, in terms of him and his life and his family, but there, there wasn't in terms of the actual time. Uh, there was, there was not a lot of res respect for him. Uh, to a certain degree, Mike was a little hypocritical about some things and acted a little bit differently, and it did didn't sit well with Gary, didn't sit well with Matt, me either. So that's a, I mean, that's about far we're going to go with him. I, I, I mean, respect it. We respect, you know, he's passed and stuff like that, you know. So I, I'll, fight I'll respect that. Shit yeah. happens. It's a fight game. So uh, you know, after the second fight took place, Gary, you got stopped. Bernardo was kind of starting to be flashy, show off, be a little disrespectful. Mark Coleman stopped that immediately. And Tom, you were right over his shoulder. Like you guys were going to beat the brakes off of him. And, and, and whoever else stepped in, yes, we were. I mean, it was serious. I don't know what took place. I, I heard some rumors that there was some locker room stuff. But, I mean, he, he came out with the two biggest bodyguards you could possibly find in the entire He's country. Coming. After he won, he stood on me. He put his leg up on me like you know, like I was a. Which you kind of did too to him as well in the no. first fight. I'm sorry. You were dancing over him in the yeah. first fight. I was dancing, but I didn't put my foot on him. I didn't touch him. He put his foot on me. I like when they kill a animal uh, in the state in uh, in Africa. They put their foot on him and take a picture of the gun. I didn't do that. That's true. That's true. Sure, yeah. yeah, I never yeah, even yeah. thought of it that way. <clears throat> yeah. Disrespect. There's, there's fine lines that you shouldn't cross, you know. So, I, I wanted to take you back to Pride because after the Grand Prix, they bring you right back like a month later to like what was a small Pride in, in uh, I think it was uh, Yokohama, but uh, or it wasn't in Tokyo, and uh, you fought Rico Rodriguez in Rico's debut, a UFC champion. What do you remember about that day? Because that was, I think you were in the locker room with Joe Hill, the little Brazilian guy that got burnt. Do you remember that whole story? No, I don't remember the story at all. Oh, okay. The, the yeah. opening fight was Matt Serra against Joe Hill de Oliveira, and de Oliveira got burnt by the, pyrotechnics. By the pyrotechnics. So, Oh, yeah. The lamp came down and burnt him. The lamps. Yes, 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 yes. Were, were you in the locker with him? Were you in the locker room with him? I don't recall. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I know there were three lockers. I was there, actually, with the yeah. guy that fought Akira Shoji, so I know yeah. that we were broken up. I wanted to see him. What was Rico like? Because uh, he's a future UFC champion, but that was his first fight. What, what was your feeling there? Rico Rodriguez. He was, uh, he was a good guy. He was, he was all right. He's, uh, you know, just, you know what? I, in, in this fight game, I've hardly met anybody that wasn't a good person. Uh, Mike... Even Mike Bernardo, you know, um, it's hard to find somebody that's not a, that's not a, a, a genuine person. In this game, everybody, we all know it's for the money. We all understand that this is not personal. So everybody talk. We can talk after and go anywhere after. Um, Mike Bernardo was a little different. Um, but everybody else in this game, I've always found something that I can share laughter sadness happiness with you know um all good guys i've only ever met good people in this sport by and uh if we didn't talk about mark bernardo okay what you about know? your what about your manager mike motts Ooh, back was, in the day who's that mike motts m-o-t mods or Mots? oh mobs Mob. mobs mobs uh, he's uh he's he's a uh, he's, he's my best friend from uh, he's been a good friend of me since uh, eight years old. Uh, when I moved from Trinidad to Canada, he's a, an amazing guy. He's a, just a good kid. He's a good kid. He just retired, um, being a police officer for thirty years. Just retired. That's cool. Yeah. So Gary, growing up in Barrie, Ontario, did you get into a lot of street fights? Not at all. Not, never gotten one. Not one. When was the first time you got punched in the face? The first time I got punched in the face was uh, I was doing boxing, training for boxing. Okay. 
That's wild. Yeah. And you 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 go from a, being a welder at the Honda plant all yeah. the way to being on pay per view. Yes. The transition was that difficult? You, you know, it was it was difficult. To, uh, no, it was all money based. Everything was money based. You know, I at Honda, I got fired from Honda. They they a fired. shipping company. Didn't you have a shipping company after the Honda job? Yeah, I did. Uh, I owned a shipping company. Yes. What did you get fired for? Uh, I got fired for stealing a donut out of the cafeteria. Um, I got fired for stealing a donut out of. I threw away a fifty thousand dollar a year job for a donut in the cafeteria. Never happened. Till till today, and that's never happened. But somebody said they saw me stealing a donut out of the cafeteria, and they fired me for that. Um, Is, because were you said, union? Were you union? No, it wasn't union. But it um, couldn't have been yeah. union. Yeah, so you would have done it here. So they got fired. Um, I decided I got to fight full time. I got to go all the way with this fighting game. So that's what happened. That's terrible. Yeah. That's no, right. it's not because now I'm retired. I don't have to worry about bullshit. I live well. I have a nice house, nice woman, nice friends. You might still be working at that plant. Yeah. Yeah, I would have just retired. Yeah. Uh, great friends, great memories that I can, you know, tell my grandkids, my great great grandkids. I live that long, you know. I, it's, it, I took a better path as far as I'm concerned. I took a much better path. My Saw body, the world, but that's life. That's everybody's body is sore. Yeah. Now, Tom I, I got, I got, I got one. I gotta get Mike. I, 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 I got you covered. You know, I got you covered. Gary, you said you met good people in the sport and stuff like that. Tell people about your experiences fighting Gilbert Ivell and Bob Schreiber because they got the reputation of being two of the baddest boys out there. So yeah. why, don't you, why don't you share with us how that goes? I got Gilbert Ivell and Bob Schreiber. Uh, Gilbert Ivell was just man, that was a fluke. Just the, how I uh, how I fluked with um, Paul Herrera. It was just I fed into his arms. The same thing he done after he kicked me in the head. I said okay. I got to beat somebody that way. That's how come my fry got that kick. Um, <laughs> if, if he didn't do that to me, fry would have never got that kick. Um, so, and then uh, Bob Shriver, yeah, he, he came up to uh, Nigger Death or something like that. The, the music that he came out to, if Nigger Death, I, I can't remember what he was saying, what, it, what the music, but people told me what the music was after. I, of course, you don't listen to it at the time. Your mind is going about fighting. But um, yeah, Bob Striver, yeah, it was, I found him a nice guy. I, I didn't find that he was an asshole. Um, Gilbert's not an asshole either. He just, the, uh, the people from Holland are different. They're very, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, yeah. Not, it's not the individual. It's the people from Holland. Everyone I know from Holland is very different. They are very so yeah. Gary. We, we're trying to interview Bob Schreiber. Someone's got to teach him how to download the Zoom app. I yeah. have got a list of all of the people that were murdered from like the 90s of from the Dutch MMA kickboxing scene. Yeah, he's one of the few that are still living that yeah. were involved that early. Yeah, he's a little different, they're, they're, they're a little different. different. Yeah, yeah, and Evel. You know, so, I mean, we, we had Gilbert on, like his story is incredible. Like he's from the Caribbean or he's from, uh, connected to the Dominican, um, uh, was it Port, Port au Pair? Oh, Haiti, he's from Haiti. His mom gets a job, you know, working at a hotel in Holland, goes home to visit for vacation for holiday, civil war breaks out. He doesn't see his mom for almost a decade after that. So he grew up on a street in a country that wasn't his own. Yeah. I mean, not an easy. I mean, every fighter has got a story. It's just, it's incredible. Tom Erickson, you I fought uh, Shannon Briggs in a K1 bout, which was a circus show. And that was Gary's fight. That was supposed to, uh, he's on there. So that was supposed to have been Gary's fight. What and happened with that? They wouldn't get, get, Gary was too tough. 
and, and it was it was a ploy by Shannon Briggs to to you know get out of fight in K one to work his way back in, and you know they they picked me, but that fight should have gone to Gary. It was supposed to be Gary's, but uh, Shannon was too tough. But he talked some trash on me because he knew he was going to whoop my ass. So that uh, Gary wasn't too happy about that one. Yeah. <laughs> you could see him just look at his face. Oh, the fight. <laughs> G- Gary, uh, he called you out afterward, and the fight never came to fruition. No, nah, he it, it's it was it would have been like calling his mom out, you know, it's something you know it's not gonna happen. But uh, it, it's the only fight that, like, Tom is my boy, man. When that happened to Tom, I I, I wanted to kick his ass after in the back, you know, I wanted to do the parking lot shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> Tom was in a decent payday. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Paid. That's good. That's good. Actually, I, actually, I thought you know, I thought I could win the fight, and, and, and it was funny because I, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of time training with Gary, but I was working on leg kicks, some low kicks, some low kicks. I'm like, I can't fight with this dude. I had to either be, I had to make a choice in that fight. Uh, dirty box, just get in there and dirty box, kind of like Couture, shoulder punch, really get nasty, dirty. Do like I did to Bernardo, throw him on the ground, throw him on his head, you know, whatever, or 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 kick kick out his legs. I, I there was no other scenario that I can win. There's just none. So yeah. we go over there. I meet Gary. Where we we kind of hook up in Japan and go through some training sessions. Like man, you like it? And he actually kind of got me even more excited because he's like, those are really good. Like they were probably just barely minor league stuff, but just working bag with low kicks and low kicks and thought like, man, if we kick this dude out, if I get a couple low, good leg kicks, I can drop him. And even Shannon, I'll tell you, like in the interviews, I've heard him say it in interviews. I'm not that I talked with him or whatever, but he even said, "Man, I get kicked a couple more times. I ain't, I ain't getting up. I'll fall down. Leg kicks are wow. bad." <laughs> Gary you fought Gigard Musasi, and it was a, supposed to be a thirty thousand dollar payday. Did Did you get paid? Did they actually come come through with the check? I really don't remember the Gigard. Where, where, where who did I fight him with? F E G K one, yeah K one. Oh okay. Um, I don't sure. It was an MMA fight. Okay, Gary, they stiffed Um, you. They stiffed you thirty grand. Did they? The the K one? Yeah. You know what the deal was? You know what that might have been, Gary. Um, that that sounds like that was around the time. Here's the deal. Uh, K one started scrambling in terms of the Yakuza paying because. They used to pay cash, blah, blah, blah. They weren't charging taxes. Remember when they hooked everybody? That was right around the time where everybody wasn't getting taxes, so they pulled taxes out of everybody's money and said, hey, you owe us taxes. So you you had negotiated fight purses, but then they'd hold the money away from you because you had to pay the taxes on stuff that you owed previously. No way. Gary, is that not true? Yes. Yes, I forgot all about that until you just brought it up. So in other words... They had it from the beginning. They knew they were getting a free card. Yeah, pretty much. I remember yeah. that right now. <laughs> yeah, because I remember a lot of people. I remember a lot of people chirping about that, and that was the thing that they fell back on. They said, "Look, we were paying you this, but we got hit with taxes, and to legitimize us, we have to pay these taxes. So you have to pay these taxes. So you owed us this money. So everybody <laughs> had to redo their contracts." To kind of put in, look, hey, this is after taxes and everything else. That's the first thing everybody started doing right after that. Before everybody fought again, they had to redo their contracts because they didn't want to get hit with these bills. They were, if they were going to make fifty, they wanted to make fifty, not twenty-five, and had to pay twenty-five in taxes. Sure, that makes sense. That's incredible. That's incredible. So they got a free fight out of you. They told you afterward, not before. Yeah. Many different ways to screw a fighter. <laughs> Uh, if now, I got, it was even I got true. potentially another one, and that how was your fight with Fedor? Because that's what I got. Let me get that Miguel. Yeah, August so 10, I, 2003, Pride Total Elimination, Fedor Milianko, and at this time, Fedor was with the Russian top team. Yeah, I fought Fedor. Um, he was, I didn't find him overly strong or overly um, anything. What happened? How, how he, he blitzed me. So he was here, going at down, no, no, then boom, 100%. And, and that just shocked me because of how it happened. And just here, here, then, wow. 
And I was like, holy fuck. And I'm taking punches all over the place before I even knew what happened. The fight's over. But that burst, just uh, from zero to 100%, it, it shocked me. Cut your rhythm. Yeah. It, just, it shocked me. I, I was done. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I was expecting a little jab, a little, you know, do, 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 but he went, da! yeah, so yeah. So you had talked about your your time that you bonded with Tom Erickson. How yeah. did you and Mark Coleman become so close? Um, I, I went to, to Mark Coleman's house and started training. Uh, he taught me how to uh, train, how to wrestle. I, I spent a lot of time with him and Randleman wrestling. And then after um, after that, uh, after that, that time when I met, I was there instead. But Mark Coleman and I just it was just it was just we're always friends. We're always friends. I'll call. Yeah, I think I talked to him yesterday too. Yeah, we talked yesterday. Can well, you tell us your insight with Kevin Randleman? Kevin Randleman, he was the most angry person that you could be. Uh, he went from, like I said, zero to 100%. He was the nicest guy I'd ever wanted to meet, but on a turn of a dime, he was like a pit bull. Rah! And uh, I, I learned that in uh, Brazil. I went to Brazil with him and like he just wanted to fight. He just went from nothing. Then he started screaming at people and like he wants to kill them. I said, like, relax, relax, hang on, relax. We're in a different country. We might not get home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. Yeah, Kevin, uh, I don't think like you had said, some people worry about jail and the police. <clears throat> I don't think that was ever a concern of Kevin. I know what he wanted to do right then and there was priority. Yes. Yeah, absolute savage. What a, what a phenomenal specimen of an athlete. Yeah. yeah. Um, team Go Ricky, Go Ricky, you founded that as well. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I did. You want to bring us through it? Uh, I was just, Go Ricky, is, uh, they gave me the name in, in Japan. And I, b I believe it's probably maybe Gatekeeper. But uh, they gave me Goriki. They said, uh, Goriki, that's superhuman strength. That's what it means. So uh, so I put the tattoo. I embraced the name. Yeah, I got superhuman strength. So I embraced the name, embraced what they gave me, and that's who I was. That was fantastic. So, so Gary, in 2012, you got diagnosed with uh, CTE. Yeah. What, what steps are you doing in order to kind of make sure you exercise your brain or feed it vitamins? Well, first, first of all, what I, what I have to do is I have to maintain a proper diet. I have to maintain things per day of what I want to do, of how I'm going to do it. And I just got to be vigilant of what I'm doing and how I'm doing things and, uh, and go over the, the, the next day, the night before. Um, it, it's, and memory is it's just, um, the CTE is really memory. It's your memory. Um, your and, and then cognizant uh, with your with your body structure, your mind, your your uh, the connection between your mind and your your your, your limbs. Um, right now, uh, I forget. Yes, I forget. But I've done pretty good tonight. You, Gary, you've been <laughs> phenomenal. G Gary, but, you've been amazing. And not only that, like and now you've been good tonight. I kind of limited the fights and. Yeah, and you've really given us a lot, man. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. But here, here's the thing with that. With CTE, the, the long-term memory is impeccable. You can't scratch from the long-term. I remember things from when I couldn't even walk. From way back then when I couldn't even, when I was crawling. As I remember things from way back then. But CTE, <clears throat> is, is your, your long-term memory is impeccable. Is what you did yesterday. That, that, that's what you found problems with. What did I do last day? I can't remember if I had to think about it. Got to really think, what did happen yesterday? Yeah, that's the if you If you tried psilocybin in order to help? Uh, suicide, yeah, you know, you, you, no, you psilocybin. No, no, psilocybin mushrooms. Oh, um, no, I never What's wrong with you? I tried, uh, <laughs> I tried marijuana and, and stuff like that, but you know what? I, I just, tr I tried to hard to eat eat right, do the right things. Uh, and I'm trying hard to just be myself and 
and maintain who I am by just being me. I, I, I got a question for you in regards to the CTE. Now, <clears throat> you fought before Zufa in the UFC and before that, but has the modern UFC, you know, offered any kind of uh, assistance or any kind of respect to, to, to know what, you know, what you've been through there? Or? No, it's... You know, when, when you get into this business, I, I, I don't think anyone says I'm going in the business to get C, um, dementia and I'm going in, the, I'm not going in this business to get CDE. Nobody says that, but you go into it and you enjoy yourself. I mean, I was one of the pioneers. Tom and I were both one of the pioneers. We started the game. There's, there's things that the pioneers have to pay to pave the way for the people that are there now. Uh, we paved the way, the way how we did. And so the people can have what they have. Am I sorry about it? No. I, do I care? Not really. I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm humble. I have a nice home. I have a nice woman. That's all I need. I'm with great friends, great memories. Um, what else can I ask for? I've lived a great life. You know, and, and I'm still living. I've had no, a good that's, time. That's fantastic. That's, I am, that's here I am on this phone call. Finishing up COVID with three great guys right now. You know what else do I want? You know I, I live a good life, man. I tell you what else. I know what else. Yes. African African Fighting Championship in Nairobi, it. December. <laughs> I, I said AFC. Yeah, I'm really happy. With, that's a project I'm so happy and excited about. So is it the Tourism Commission? Who, who's who's helping you with it? Um, nobody's helping me with it. I'm doing it myself with, uh, there it is, Tom. Put it up there. Let me see it. AFC. There we go. There's a lady that's lawyer cool. that's helping him, right? Yeah. There's a woman that's a lawyer over there. Her and I are just trying to do it ourselves, you know, petting our way through it, stepping through it. Yeah. I'm excited. That's fantastic. Yeah. Another name that we should probably bring up, Gary Myers. Who the hell is that? Gary Myers, come on, man! No, you got to. Yeah, there, there, there isn't a crossover. There's a lot of crossover with those guys. Who is Gary Myers? G G Gary's, Gary's with us when we went to Chicago. We went to the UFC in Chicago. Yeah, he he was with us at, when we were at Cage Side uh, in the at the fights in Chicago that one time. We well, the last time it's been years ago, whatever. Fantastic but, person. He he kind of helped connect us with this interview. Yeah. yeah, he helped, he hooked us up with Tom. So so we owe Gary this whole tree of interviews. Gary's an old school guy too. But Mr. Goodrich, I, I want to thank you because you said pioneer. And man, there's no better word for that. Because like you said, you, you were experiencing things for the first time in the cage. We saw things for the first time that you did. After that, it's all a repeat. So literally... I feel like I've just been talking to like Superman or you know Batman yeah. for like the last two hours, man. Thank you so much. Any tattoo? Uh, Superman. It's Tom Eric. Any closing uh, yeah. remarks for you, Tom? No, man, look, anytime I get to be on and, and talk with Gary, communicate with Gary, it's a good time, man. I, I like I say, remember the first time I met him was great. You know, heck, that that night after we fought. Uh, he put Sakuraba on his shoulders. We went out there. And we're, we're, we're at the fights that night. So, uh, man, anytime I get a chance to get there and sit there and talk about somebody else's career, how we intersected and things like that, it's always a great time, man. We always appreciate you guys. And then, you know, the AFC and, and stuff like that, if we can get something, if we can help Gary get that thing going over there, it's only going to help the world Everybody. of mixed martial arts in general. And, then, and, and that's why this is a pretty exciting thing. So hang on a minute here, Tom. The night that you kicked my ass, that's the night that I pushed Shaka Rob on my shoulders? Yes. And I didn't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> now, how did Sakuraba wind up on it? Now, I, I, I know that Sakuraba liked the party a little bit. Were you guys getting loose together? Yeah, he's a good kid. He's a good kid. <laughs> we got to remember, we, we stayed at the, the Tokyo Hilton. So Shinjuku was right over the, down the street from there. So <clears throat> right. Did you go to... Rapungi a lot as well, Gary, or did you stay in like Tokyo? No, Pro? I went to Rapungi once. And my G G Gary's not a big drinker. 
Here's the secret, great. Mike. Rapongi is where they take the tourists. Shinjuku, right. But Shinjuku, what he mentioned, is the true red light district for the Japanese people. That's kind of where. Yeah. So you, <laughs> you know, you could go, you could go to Rapongi where you know. They're Jamaican women at the bars and stuff like that. Or you could go to authentic Japanese locations like in the red light district. So, And and if you know, in the red light district, there's a neighborhood right next to it called the Golden District, which is like literally 400 small bars, like bars that fit five or six people in like four or five square blocks. Literally 400 bars, man. So, yeah, yeah. you got you got to get away from Rapungi, guys. <laughs> Gary? absolute pleasure thank you for giving us your time i i, I it's truly an honor if there's a mount rushmore of canadian mixed martial arts carlos newton yourself yeah I, I, you, you guys are definitely two people that are on it the pleasure is all yours <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, you so much, thank you so much um, man we owe you one thank you sir no you're not man we'll see you guys you, you, you have a good one man love you my brother yeah, I love you too, Tom. But hang, hang on a minute, guys. I want you to send me the this tape copy, please. Yes. Okay. This tape copy. You gotta tell me and send it to me. Don't tell me yes, and then I don't get it. Oh, we'll no, get no. it. What, what I, I will, will do is I'll oh, download it when I save it right now, and I'll send it to Tom and yourself by email. Thank Absolutely. You, appreciate it. It, 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 I mean, we'll have links. Everything. <laughs> everything will be in there by Wednesday. Wednesday it'll be up. Thanks, oh. Gary. Appreciate, buddy. Well, Mike. Gary Goodridge is in the books. A big shout out to Gary Myers. A big shout out to Tom Erickson for helping us make it happen. And Mike, that's history for you, man. Well, we almost didn't get this one a couple times. Like uh, Miguel sent me a message, and this just kind of speaks the volumes of the situation that Gary Goodrich is in. Like, obviously, incredibly positive, great mood. But when I called him up to kind of just do a little bit of prep, just to make sure everything's cool. He's like, yeah, I don't do podcasts. I'm like, okay, well, Gary Meyer and no, no, no. I mean, I get what you're saying. You know, it's cool. I just don't do podcasts. Um, no, he was just nice about it. He's like, man, just have a good day, brother. I just, I just don't, I just don't like doing podcasts. So I'm like, I called Tom Erickson. And I'm like, well, Tom, here's the situation. And Tom was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So we pulled Tom in. He sat in with the interview. And I think that type of trust that, uh, Gary has with Tom allowed Gary to be incredibly honest with each other. Yeah. And I think that that's another one of those things that is notable in this interview makes it like a, an all-star interview in my book is that Tom was along with us and, you know, you get two superstars for the price of one, but that's not really the height. Our intent. I think yeah, it wasn't our intent. There yeah. is the love and the bond between the two guys, Yeah, you know, that they fought each other. But that at the end of the day in the locker room, that, that bond, we've seen it in many interviews. And here it was, you know, one very noticeable. Obviously, Tom along for the interview to help Gary out. And Gary, you know, referred to the bond many times of, of you know, the friendship that he developed with these guys and how they trust each other in, in many ways and stuff. And I think that that is one of the special things that you get an insight to in this interview. You rarely see two guys like that. In an interview, in public, you know, backing each other up and, and you know, supporting each other and things like that. So I, I think, you know, kudos to both guys. I think both guys are, you know, advanced human beings on the physical side. Now here on, on the spiritual side, and uh, yeah. I, I much respect. So you had mentioned support. Ladies and gentlemen, you might notice that Miguel has a new computer. And every once in a while, when he uses his, his phone, he's got a light stand. One of our p people that listen to the show anonymously donated that. We sincerely appreciate it. There's like a actual, like a lot of costs, even though we're kind of bare bones making this podcast happen. It's important to us. We hope it's as important to you. And yeah, you know, the person that, that, that gave it to us is asked to remain anonymous, but it's hard. I mean, with heartfelt gratitude, we, we appreciate it. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're not that expensive in the scope of things. Um, but, you know, life goes on. We're all kind of doing this as a, a, a labor of love. I, you know, Mike deserves a big shout out because he, he does take on a lot of the financial burden along with Chris. You know, I'm stuck here in Costa Rica, kind of out of the loop on a lot of things. So, yeah, you know, it, it's definitely something that now that we made a comeback and we're down to one interview a week, I think 
you know, it's definitely sustainable, but I think that it would be nice to see some more love and support, not, you know, for a light or anything like that, but for longevity. Cause I think, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of interviews really that need to be done. So. Yeah. Yeah. And on top of that, Miguel, um, this podcast is also, not only is it growing because we're looking at the numbers, but it's also opening up avenues of, of work for both Miguel and I. Miguel, you landed a matchmaker job with Anthony Showtime Pettis for, for his Fight Pass show. Yeah, he's got a show in Milwaukee August 12th. So <laughs> getting my feet wet, meeting some of the new people out there, and, you know, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how the fights go. Uh, but I'm, it's, you know, it's the same but different, and, you know, you got to adjust with everything. So I'm, I'm having fun doing it, and I want to thank Anthony Pettis and Damien and that crew, you know, Jeremy and, and yourself, actually, you know, all for making that that gig happen so yeah, you know we'll see it's, it's good it's, well, it's all hot i'm not too worried about it you know there, there's 80 days before the fight they're like where's the card i'm like ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> whatever i turn in today is going to be different probably about two days before by about 40 percent so but you know so, yeah, and with my go ahead. let me go all right so no, with I'm myself just having fun that's all i'm just having fun with it good so with myself, I just did, so my Friday was FAC 14 in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Um, that was on Fight Pass. My Saturday, I was in Northern Iowa for Northern Iron Fights with uh, Mike Estes um, in Mason City, Iowa. Um, they had actually a pretty fun card. Carlos Moda fought on that. And um, Sunday, I flew home. I was dead, but, man, we had Gary Goodrich. Like, it was kind of one of those... We got the research done, which was done a long time ago. There's certain people that we kind of just have done for emergency purposes. This was one of them. So I was, I was wiped out. <laughs> yeah, no, um, you got, you, you, there's some that you just, you got to move them out and do. And I think Gary, as you mentioned, yeah. uh, you know, a, a pioneer, a, a Canadian Mount Rushmore of MMA kind of. For sure. Right. Would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. You know, and you know, we you, you hear the CTE has been around now for about 10 years in public that he's had it. And, you know, since then, obviously, the interviews and the number of times he's appeared like that are very, very limited. So, you know, I look at it as, as we got a, a, a real golden opportunity. I don't know if that's the right word. It was it's kind of like the kind of thing where he also he also. And, and Tom Erickson helped a lot with that, too. It's like he also, I think, chose our podcast, kind of like, was like, all right, that's one I can do, as opposed to, like, right. you know, the riffraff that's out there. And that made me feel pretty good. You know? Yeah, and Erickson listens. He spent two yeah. hours with us completely stress-free, not, like, you know, watching the clock or anything like that. So, yeah, the, the, the whole thing is, to me, another one of those feathers in the cap, and we got another pioneer out of the way, and there's no doubt about that. This is a pioneer. Yeah. And um, we hope to have Coleman in the next few weeks. He's like, he's a friend of the show. Mark Coleman is a friend of this show. And that's how difficult he is to kind of wrangle in. So um, we mentioned it. He agreed a couple of days ago. It'll definitely happen, but it might not be on the timeline that we hope for. Mm -hmm. So um, also, another person that should be on our radar is Bob Ballou. He also is suffering from uh, fighter dementia and we um, we really and we reached out to him several times we just can't connect so if anybody out there can help us with with, with Babalu man it, he's an absolute pioneer and somebody that I think would fit well in our system yeah you know I, I wonder how his English is because I don't know, but it's pretty good. I've, I've heard a couple of interviews. I know that he's been yeah. he's been around for so long. I was actually a, a, I remember when he came. And this is an interesting story. He fought on one of the IBCs. I think it was where Hinkle fought Beretta, and uh, he showed up and he was with the Ruas team and Rizzo and those guys. So he was not a jujitsu guy, and he had a wrestling shirt on. It said. You know, something along the line. It wasn't like it was one of those things that we later on would associate with MMA, sort of like, you know, pain like embrace the grind or something. The body yeah. or it was something yeah. like that. Wrestling is, you know, something. It was a pure wrestling shirt. And that was a connection he immediately had with Coleman and Hinkle. So it was a, you know, it was an interesting 
he's been every bit of a pioneer too, you know, from those old days and stuff. And, and you, you get sad when you think about, uh, you know, this type of thing catching up to him, you know. And one, one of the other, you know, to put a cap on the Gary Goodrich interview, one of the other things that's so, like, to me, heartwarming about that interview is if there was ever a dude who could be bitter at this sport, you know, it, they, it took so much away from him, you know, upstairs, you know, he's diagnosed and, and suffers with short-term memory, as he mentioned. Um, he gave so much in the ring. You know, he lives well, and he's taking care of him. He's got his home and things like that. But I don't think, you know, that he's got 5 or $10 million in the bank from the sport. That's kind of really weird. A guy, guys like that, you kind of had a hope, you know, that they would be. And he's not bitter, you know. And that's the part of it that I found to be uplifting about the Gary Goodrich interview is, like, boxers from the old days you know they went out so ugly sometimes and there were such sad stories and things and you know those are still few and far between in MMA you know there's yeah big, mired you know, with drugs and alcohol yeah and, you know, you know was, I, I, I know they're coming and that's the kind of thing that's scary you know they Ooh. may be out there in the sport we haven't done them up yet or whatever but if, if there was a candidate for a guy who might, you know, might have come back and said, you know, I hate MMA, you know, it damaged me or, you know, bitterness. And you saw none of that in Gary. So, you know, my hat's off to him. That's a, that's a man that, you know, physically and spiritually, I admire. Absolutely. So ladies and gentlemen, please like, share and subscribe. And I use the word ladies loosely. I doubt we have a single female listener, but gentlemen and possibly a single female, please like, share, subscribe. And I'm going to tell you what, Miguel. Mike, Mike, that's, a, that's a subject you shouldn't even touch. We, we might have some, you know, midlife crisis confused dudes out there listening, too. It's, <laughs> true. it's true. It's right. Zer, Zim, we appreciate you listening. Kuwait, the country of Kuwait. I'm assuming there's like a military installation there that is just devouring our podcast because they just broke like the top 10 in a very short time in regards to um countries of download so whoever's listening from kuwait man i sincerely appreciate it like share subscribe thank you thank you and uh, for the kuwaitis if you are a kuwaiti national no insult uh, you know more power uh, for sure you. we appreciate it. it's just there's so many downloads coming from such a small country that we kind of assume it's military or american expats yeah. or whatever but if you've got you know a little extra oil money you Man, <laughs> oh, no, no, I'll even take gas. Yeah, we'll we'll take, that we'll take, we'll take gas. the gas. No money exchange. We'll take the no, product. No, no. It'll be a barter thing. We'll give you podcasts. You give us gas. Dude, <laughs> dude, I'll be posted up on the south side of Chicago selling Ziploc baggies of gas, bro. Send that. There we go. So, All anyway, right. Gary, thank you. And hopefully, we'll thank see you, thank you in you. Africa, brother. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.